Welcome. This is part two of the Keynesian Revolution, 1936 to 1965. In part one, I had just finished up looking at the 1950s, this being a time where America experienced impressive post-war post -war prosperity. And there was the necessary revenue that allowed liberal politicians to continue uh, with their uh, government spending. So there was increased government spending, and this was the, the Keynesianism that remained dominant in the 1950s. So I want to begin looking at, uh, actually looking more at the 1950s and starting with the President Dwight Eisenhower. The, the first Republican president since Herbert Hoover did not reverse the enthusiasm for Keynesian thinking. Yes, President Dwight Eisenhower did appoint business executives, including the president of General Motors, to his cabinet, and he stated his opposition to artificial and arbitrary government controls. He also declared his government's determination to reduce the federal budget. In 1957, in 1957, Treasury Secretary George Humphrey argued that government spending during the recession was a bad idea. I don't think you can spend yourself rich. But then again, Eisenhower made no serious assault on welfare programs and conservatives declared he did not go far enough to reduce budgets. The issue that mystified Eisenhower and others was the power of regulatory agencies created in the New Deal years to regulate markets and prevent monopolies. No one had a clear idea how to deal with these agencies. Economic activity in Eisenhower's last two years was modest and unemployment was relatively high, only falling below 5% for one month. Given that there were recessions during the winter of 1953-1954, also in 1957 in to 1958, and in 1960, the notion of Eisenhower prosperity was off the mark. In fact, economic growth for the Eisenhower years was only 2.4%, about half of the rate of growth during the Truman years. The 1948 tax cut and the government's commitment to eliminate the debt resulted in better economic times than what took place during the Eisenhower years. The government continued to grow and most Republican leaders were unable or unwilling to alter the, the dominance of Keynesianism, seen as essential to keeping employment numbers healthy. The overall, overall role of the government continued to grow and Keynesians pointed to a rising standard of living. Keynesian John Kenneth Galbraith described America's affluent society. By the early 1960s, America witnessed a transition on the issue, issues of social welfare and employment. Employment Alvin Hansen wrote in 1961, quote, the progress we shall make in the decades ahead towards a truly high standard of living will, de will depend above all else upon the decree degree to which we choose to employ the vast powers of a democratic government. More and more, the trend toward a service society will be paralleled by the growth of the welfare state. The following year, President John F. Kennedy presented his welfare message to Congress. It was time to change the federal government's role in assisting Americans. 
Roosevelt's New Deal was the government using emergency and temporary measures to set to get Americans back on the right track, such as financial assistance to a widow with small children in the short term. Kennedy's understanding of the role of government re represented a major departure. Government was now to provide long-term assistance for Americans, including people disadvantaged by an unjust system. It became acceptable for the government to disseminate money to employable and healthy adults year after year. The role of government also was to ensure full employment, and Keynesians believe that demand rarely equaled supply. Thus, government was to lift demand to the level of supply and ensure what is supplied is bought. Without the interjection of government spending, the volatile investment expenditures of business, businesses would cause workers to lose their jobs. Many legislators embraced the narrative that government spending caused people's incomes to rise, triggering more consumer spending, which in turn increased the demand for goods and services. In 1965, Washington policymakers, following Keynes' ideas, were able to lift the nation through the fifth and best consecutive year of the most sizable, prolonged, and widely, widely distributed prosperity in history. Even businessmen were receptive, no longer viewing deficit spending as immoral they supported government intervention to minimize recession or inflation. Optimism abounded. A Time article noted that if America has economic problems, they are the problems of high employment, high growth, and high hopes. One important tool for Keynesians during the 1960s and beyond was the Phillips curve, named after economist A.W. Phillips. It demonstrated a long-term inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. As one rose, the other declined. Since the Kennedy administration, policymakers used the curve to guide the government's objective of full employment defined as approximately 4% unemployment. Because of labor market frictions, such as going from one job to another, and this would take time, zero unemployment was an unrealistic marker. Using the Phillips curve, Keynesian policymakers argued that an unemployment rate of 4% in the United States would only mean an inflation rate of about 3%. And this was seen as a reasonable trade-off. Macroeconomic management of the economy looked promising. Besides, many legislators saw no advantage in exercising financial restraint. Political leaders gained power by promising to pay and solve the economic problems that concern vocal groups who wanted more government programs to meet their needs. The normal normalization of greater government intervention and the welfare state opened the door for others to pre press for more radical changes. Radicalism birthed in the 1950s, came in many shapes with distinct agendas. With the rise of the so-called New Left, there was criticism of those pragmatic liberals who were unwilling to go the distance for genuine reform. If members of the New Left were reluctant to embrace revolutionary Marxism, they at least were 
is enthusiastic about the ideas of American intellectuals, such as C. Wright Mills, a sociologist at Columbia University. In the Power Elite, published in 1956, Mills pointed to the shortcomings of establishment thinkers that corrupted liberalism and, it, and impoverished post-war liberalism saw no liberals defending any left or even militantly liberal position. In this climate, there was no negative stereotype widely formed of the corporate rich and the political outsider. And if one or two should crop up in popular imagery, they are soon vanquished by the forward-looking, energetic, clean-cut American boy as executive. This is, this is Mill's words. Mill's also lamented that two or three hundred giant corporations dominated the economy. In the early 1960s, one important college radical wrote his sociology master's thesis on Mills, University of Michigan graduate student and Irish Catholic Tom Hayden was a leader of Students for a Democratic Society, the leading organization of the new left. According to Hayden, there was much wrong with America. Half of the early SDS, S, SDS elite were from broken homes, and so it filled the void for young radicals desiring to find a community of peers to take seriously and to be taken seriously by. Hayden spearheaded its manifesto called the Port Huron Statement written in 1962 in a rundown union building in Port Huron, Michigan. In five days, delegates, many experiencing sleepless nights because of intense excitement and pure exaltation, put together a 50-page document that identified their intellectual and political home. Nevertheless, there were notable tensions. When 17-year-old Jim Hawley, an activist in the Communist Party orbit, crashed the gathering, a few opposed his presence, while most voted that he, that he stay as an observer. His seating, seating symbolized a significant tra trajectory of left activism. America, the left, argued could do better than Keynesianism. The Port Huron Statement was a rambling document covering a wide range of political causes. There was a sense of urgency to find revolutionary leadership to correct modern problems, many mired in traditional thinking. A significant component of the statement was on the economy, the power of the wealthiest 1%, the scandal of 35 million in poverty, the short-sightedness of consumerism and materialism, the lost jobs and social dislocation caused by automation, and the evil of big business. The American economy was the enemy as it was the envy all the world, but the radical students demand it more. Quote, we take for granted the existence and desirability of the New Deal reforms, and we look, we look with anger at the legacies, the unfinished reforms of our liberal ancestors. End of quote. It was time for political action. Responding to an earlier draft, of the Port Huron Statement, one of Hayden's friends advised caution. Well-known socialist and Irish Catholic Michael Harrington wanted Hayden's draft to be more critical of the Soviet Union. It appeared to imply 
the United States was the prime source of evil in the Cold War. In the mid, in his mid thirties, Harrington was someone worth listening to. His book, The Other America, Poverty in the United States, published in 1962, received widespread attention among liberals. Born in 1928 and educated at Holy Cross College, Yale University Law School, and the University of Chicago, where, where he received an MA in English literature, Harrington worked as an editor of a Catholic worker in the early 1950s and later joined the Young Parties, sorry, the Young People's Socialist League, the youth, of, youth affiliate of the American Socialist Party. In the other America, Harrington argued that there were as many as 50 million poor Americans who were becoming incredibly visible, invisible. As he saw it, the welfare state helped the poor least of all. It favored not the desperate, but those who were capable of helping themselves. In affluent America, it was little consolation that the poor were better off than the poor in Italy, India, Russia, or an earlier America. His standard of comparison was how much better the poor could be if only we were stirred. Harrington discussed various categories of the classic poor, including a subculture of poverty composed of intellectuals bohemians and beats, many of who were graduate students and artistic others who rejected standard social conventions and the working world. This subculture lived in the midst of physical deprivation, according to Harrington. One major problem for the poor was housing. But the building of low cost projects fell short of the demand. An estimate to cure the problem of slums was 125 billion investment. That was not beyond the bounds of possibility. There was hope in the labor movement, but the best approach to fight poverty was federal government planning using knowledge in a rational and systematic way. Washington had, had money and location for coordination and national planning. Harrington, Hayden, and a growing number of young leftists desired deliberate centralized economic planning instead of modest microeconomic management. Harrington influenced the new left and many others into the 1970s. With his book, there was less consideration that independent choice played a role in people not having employment. Few denied Harrington's concern for the poor, yet his assessment of the poor as victims had a destructive le legacy, according to conservatives. When he argued that economic expansion was not helpful to the poorest poor, and the poor's self-destructive behavior had little relevance, he gave poverty activists a false understanding of economic inequality. Guided by such thinking, academia, the press, and the judiciary told the poor their condition was due more to a defective economic order than issues of personal responsibility and self-control. Some radicals found themselves on another path. Former Marxist economist Thomas Sowell was one who had experienced an ideological, ideological transformation, and his publications during the 1970s were part of the shift to free market ideas offering new solutions to economic malaise. 
born in 1930 in North Carolina, Saul never met his father who died before the newborn entered the world. Having four other children, his mother was unable to care for the new baby. Aunt Molly, Mama, raised Thomas, who learned later in life that he had brothers and sisters. There were many years of living in poverty. One of the most amazing things in his childhood was learning that hot water could come from an indoor faucet. Mama and Thomas moved to New York City before he turned nine, and Harlem was an education for the young soul. One day, a white kid asked him why he did not act like the, quote, colored people in the movies. Soul answered, well, they get paid to act that way, and I don't. How did Soul act? Apparently not foolishly, foolishly, except for the school pranks. Teachers discovered his high intelligence. Pity the teacher who received Soul's answer to a question in Latin. Then there was a teacher who gave him a 93 on a term report, even though he never scored less than 95 on any test. Confronted by a stubborn soul, the long-suffering man changed the mark to 96. Nonetheless, stubborn, stubbornness is good and bad. And at age 16, Sol quit high school. His first full-time job was on Western, was a Western Union messenger. He lived alone, experiencing, experiencing periods of unemployment and often down to his last dollar as he juggled work with night school. His appetite for reading was enormous and he bought an old set of encyclopedias for $1.17. And under the entry of Karl Marx were, quote, ideas I was to be attracted to for the next decade. After serving two years in the Marine Corps, Sol entered Howard University, followed by Harvard University. He graduated from Harvard Magna Cum Laude writing an impressive honors thesis on Karl Marx. Next, he earned his master's degree in economics at Columbia University in nine months, the minimum of time allowed. There he wrote his, his thesis on Marx's business cycle theory. Still a Marxist, Sol got his PhD at the University of Chicago, where he took classes from professors such as Milton Friedman. It was not his academic education that pushed him to question whether government intervention was beneficial. After working as an inter intern at the U.S. Department of Labor in 1960, Sol began rethinking the idea of government as a benevolent force in the economy and society. Sol focused his research on how the free market presented opportunities for all Americans. There was economic progress for all ethnic groups, an important observation given that many people in the world continue to, quote, live at an economic level not much above that of their ancestors. End of quote. The greatest improvement in the United States was the Jews who rose from 19th century poverty to earning more than any other ethnic group by the 1970s. Much of this was because of their attitude towards self improvement. Quote Jews seized upon free schools, libraries, and settlement houses in America with a tenacity and determination unexcelled and seldom approached by others. Equally important to Sol's empirical research on economic growth was his analysis of American politics driven by either a constrained or unrestrained vision. Philosopher and economist Adam Smith 
was represented, representative of the constrained vision. It recognizes human nature as unchangeable and attempts to, quote, determine how the moral and social benefits desired could be produced in the most efficient way within that constraint. The constraint vision favors trade-offs rather than the perfectible solutions implicit in the unconstrained vision. Echoing the themes of philosopher William Godwin, modern progressives in America believed in the unconstrained possibilities of humans and were confident of solving social problems institutionally. This vision saw the promise of government in improving the economy. Quote, poverty or other sources of dissatisfaction could only be a result of evil intentions or blindness to solutions readily achievable by changing existing institutions. End of quote. Souls, a conflict of visions, offer helpful insights on government action. However, his critical evaluations of government in the 1960s, when he began his academic teaching, had yet to be heard beyond a small circle of people. By the 1960s, there were only two schools of econ economics offering any worthwhile challenge to Keynesianism and each upheld the constrained vision that was suspicious of central planning. The Austrian School of Economics, led by Hayek and Ludwig von Mies, made its mark as part of a growing conservative movement composed of classical liberals, also known as libertarianism, libertarians, traditionalists, and anti-communists. Libertarian in their thinking, the Austrian economists were especially anti-government. In addition to Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, Mises' Human Action, published in 1949, was a compelling book on the problems of planned economies. The Austrians rejected the vision of progressives and trusted the market to allocate society's limit, limited resources in a more efficient manner. For the Austrian school, the entrepreneur was key to wealth creation, someone alert to new opportunities for innovative goods and production, and willing to take a chance when there was no guarantee of success. Those who exercised poor judgment in the market were responsible for their actions. This accountability encour encouraged people to conduct business as intelligently as possible. The Austrians distrusted economic and governmental experts and complicated algebraic equations or formulas that sought to manipulate economic conditions to realize market equilibrium. They knew an economy was too complex to plan and control, even by the so-called best and brightest Keynesians who thought otherwise. For one, consumers, quote, are constantly learning, changing tastes, and demanding new products to meet new wants. During the 1950s and 1960s, Austrian school arguments trickled down in a popular form in libertarian and conservative magazines such as The Free Man, which was influential among conservatives despite its small readership. Economist Henry Hazlitt, did much to explain Austrian economics on a, popular, on a popular level. In short, well-written articles, in, sh in short, well-written articles, he spoke with authority and clarity when he responded to a wide range of attacks on free enterprise. 
in ha Hazlitt's eyes, the free market was the most human of all systems because of its ability to provide a wealth of goods and services for everyone. With simple language, he exposed what he saw were the, were the problems with too much government intervention. The imposition of a progressive income tax, minimum wage laws, coercive unionism, and flawed welfare policy all represented a sabotaged capitalism. The Chicago School of Economics, which made major contributions on monetary theory, likewise presented important critiques of Keynesian thinking. In addition to reaffirming classical theory, monetarists focused on the role of money in causing both inflation and cyclical disturbances. They saw the Keynesian preoccupation with fiscal policy as misguided. The key spokesman was Milton Friedman, whose parents came from, the small, from a small town located in Austro-Hungary. Both immigrated to the United States in the, in the 1890s and met and married later in Brooklyn, New York. His father was self-employed as a petty trader and his mother's working experience began as a seamstress in a sweatshop. Contrary to the bad reputations of sweatshops, she never spoke negatively of her seamstress work, according to Friedman. Friedman entered Rut Rutgers University at age 16 and worked part-time to pay for his tuition. Before he went to the University of Chicago for graduate studies, he did a stint of door-to-door -door encyclopedia sales. A good scholarship led him to Columbia University where he completed his PhD. Friedman had established ties with the Austrian school through his particip participation in the M Mount Pelerin Society an organization named after Mount Pelerin in Switzerland, where prominent free market economists held a conference in 1947. Subsequent yearly conferences earned the Mount Pelerin Society the title of, quote, the international who's who of non-status scholars. Friedman feared the government was serving as a parent charged with the duty of coercing some to aid others. He lamented the popular belief that individuals face uncontrollable forces, and thus the government's role went beyond acting as an umpire. Government was to intervene by way of the growing number of, quote, benevolent public servants, servants. It seemed that older notions of individual responsibility, laissez-faire, and a smaller government were of the past and out of step with, progress, with a progressive vision. The modern welfare state was the government taking the leading role and responsibility in making society better rather than the individual. Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, published in 1962, represented a daring and iconoclastic assault on the failures of conventional liberal wisdom. He was one of the first economists to make a strong case that the severe unemployment of the Great Depression was a result of government mismanagement rather than systematic problems with capitalism. Once, one lesson he learned from history was how the con concentrated power of status planners wrought havoc. As he saw, saw it, quote, the country is the collection of individuals who compose it, not something over and above them. To ensure freedom, he wanted government power 
limited and dispersed. Friedman observed that many arguments against the free market uh, hinted of a lack of belief in freedom itself. Egalitarians arguing for justice in economic policies inevitably would choose equality over freedom, whereas freedom understood that at some point, quote, equality comes sharply into conflict with freedom. The ideas expressed in Capitalism and Freedom found an audience and the publisher sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Nonetheless, his vision was at odds with much of the mainstream press. The New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Newsweek, and other major national publications failed to review the book despite it selling in the hundreds of thousands of copies. The following year, Milton Friedman and Anna J. Schwartz published the Pathbreaking, A Monetary History of the United States, 1867 to 1960. That, according to one economist, quote, did more than any other work to dispel the conventional wisdom that unfettered capitalism was responsible for the irregular up and down of productions and jobs, that is, the business cycle. The statistical evidence compiled by Friedman and Swartz was prodig prodigious and challenged many non-believers to seriously consider the role of monetary policy in cyclical movements of economic activity. Keynesians now face a valent component who possess learning and wit. Friedman's election as the president of the American Economic Association in 1967 was evidence of his international reputation as a scholar. If press accounts are an accurate indicator, many liberals ignored free market economists. But then again, he and other Chicago school economists had one significant advantage over the Austrian school. Suspicious of quantitative economics, Mies and, the, and other Austrians favored a gigantic philosophy of human action which opposed interventionism on principle. More relevant to academia, the Chicago School welcomed the empirical data of economic scholarship used to demonstrate how government programs actually malfunctioned in practice. While the Austrian and Chicago sc economic schools continued the cr criticism of Keynesianism, there was a future Nobel Prize winning economist setting the foundation of another school of economics that became a major player years later. In the early 1960s, Robert Mundell presented in interesting work on taxation, charting new territory that earned him um, many academic awards in the future. Mundell seemed an unlikely scholar to shake up American economic thinking. He was a Canadian who lived his early years in Kingston, Ontario, before moving with his family to British Columbia where he studied economics at the University of British Columbia while working in an assortment of jobs. The next step for him was the University of Washington in Seattle, and finally MIT on a scholarship. He entered MIT with zero knowledge of calculus, but he was a quick learner and earned a reputation as an expert in composing graphs in economics. A fellowship at the London School of Economics introduced Mundell to key economic luminaries, 
after completing his PhD in 1956, he taught at several universities as he worked on an economic policy favoring mo monetary tightness and lower taxes. Tight money caused interest rates to rise, which attracted foreign capital and lower taxes encourage greater production and employment. The idea of foreign capital flow threw a wrench in the Keynesian notion of national economic management. Still, Mundell's work was, was just economic theory, only existing to a few academics. It would be a number of years before challenges to Keynesianism began to take political expression and reach the attention of others outside of the field of economic scholarship. The, Keynesian, the Keynesianism that economic professors such as Harvard, Albert, Alvin, Hansen taught was the language many politicians embraced. It encouraged the government to stimulate the economy and thus promise opportunity for the American people. The free market theory of the Austrian and Chicago schools remained completely outside the circles of most Washington politicians. There were too few challenge challengers, even if several were future Nobel Prize winners to make a significant impact on how politicians interpreted Keynesian ideas. The Keynesian revolution persisted, virtually unaffected by challenges from radicals and free market scholars during the 1960s. Most Americans enjoyed unprecedented affluence and the confidence for the future. So just to conclude, there was little for them to complain about. Keynesian micromanagement of the economy seemed successful. Simply put, simply put, we see that <clears throat> deficit spending remains an attractive option for stimulating the American economy out of recession and the Democratic Party benefited greatly. Lyndon Johnson was ready to take the Keynesian revolution one extra step to make society great. So that's the conclusion of this lecture and looking at the Keynesian revolution from the mid-1930s up into the mid-1960s we see that it uh, remained dominant there were some signs of uh, other uh, ideas, econ other economic ideas that would begin to challenge it. But as far as the politicians were concerned, Keynesian was the way to go. Thank you very much.